Howdy everybody, Green Films Official here. Now, considering it's officially the spooky month and horror is my favorite genre, I thought it would be fun to recommend some of my favorite lesser known and underappreciated horror films. That's about it, really. Um, I've also included chapters in the description so you can skip around a bit if you want to. And I think uh, with all that said, let's get into the movies. The first film I would like to talk about, Matango, is a delightfully trippy and unnerving voyage into the unknown. Based on a short story called The Voice in the Night, written by William Hope Hodgson and directed by Shiro Honda, who also directed the original Godzilla, this film is centered around five vacationers and two crewmen who, after a storm damages their yacht, become stranded on a tropical island. They try their best to stay alive long enough to repair their yacht, but increasingly unsettling developments reveal that something else is on the island. Contrary to what the shitty US title, Attack of the Mushroom People, would have you believe, this film is a lot more focused on body horror and psychological dread than schlocky mushroom creature attacks. The tango's psychological elements work because it spends a great deal of time on these characters and how their relationships with one another start to fall apart the more desperate they become to survive, and later for more disturbing reasons. Furthermore, the film does a great job at using the environment the characters are in to generate horror. For instance, the island is a great setting. It's entrenched in fog, making it very atmospheric and mysterious, and the fungi-ridden jungle allows for the mushroom people to blend into their environment, adding a layer of threat and eeriness to the place. And the abandoned ship that the main characters use as a home is also a pretty effective horror setting. It's very claustrophobic, and the dull and muted colors give it a very uncomfortable feeling, especially once the characters start losing their minds. It's almost like a visual representation of their eroding sanity. Overall, it's just a really great setting and it adds a lot of isolation and hopelessness to the film, which is what a setting like this should do. Even when the mushroom people do show up, it doesn't feel that schlocky or B-movie-esque. In fact, it's actually very uneasy and disorienting most of the time. A lot of the encounters with the creatures are presented in a very bizarre and trippy way, most likely as a way of tying into the film's message of drug addiction. And outside of one scene, it rarely feels as though the mushroom people are outright attacking our characters, and more so like they are freakishly breaking their minds in order to lure them into a grim, inescapable fate. I find that the strange feeling coming from these scenes comes from the clever camera work and, for the most part, the brilliant sound design. The laughter of the mushroom people is genuinely haunting and easily one of the most memorable parts of the film. It adds a lot to the disorienting feel of their scenes, and it never fails to send a chill down my spine every time I hear it. Pair that with the eerie and psychedelic soundtrack and, well, you have some grade A nightmare fuel on your hands. What makes this film work for me beyond the horror elements is its commentary. Ashiro Honda has stated that this film is a commentary on what he calls the rebel era and the rampant drug addiction it sparked, adding that the circumstance of addiction is, in his eyes, a rather helpless one. This idea of addiction becoming a helpless situation is very clear in the film, as the characters in the film know they shouldn't eat the mushrooms, and yet they seem to be unable to help themselves and ultimately give in becoming doomed to a terrible fate. While a few aspects of Matango feel a little dated, such as some of the effects, it ultimately succeeds in what it's going for, and if you go into it with an open mind, you'll be sure to appreciate its creative direction and effective psychological horror elements. Up next we have White Dog, which is a gripping tale about the horrors of racism. Directed by Samuel Fuller, the plot follows a young actress named Julie who decides to adopt a white German Shepherd she accidentally hit with her car. However, she is horrified to learn that the dog has been trained to attack black people on sight. Later, an animal trainer named Keys finds out about the dog and decides to focus his efforts on fixing the dog and bringing its reign of terror to an end. It's a film that raises some very interesting questions about what causes racism and portrays it as a sort of contagious disease, passing itself from one being to another, 
unable to be fully cured from those who it infects. It places its characters in a position where they're not sure whether trying to fix the dog is even worth it, or if they should just kill the thing. They're not sure if fixing the dog is even possible. What if it's too far gone to be able to do anything? Or, alternatively, what if killing him is the same thing as doing nothing, and that they should still hold on to hope that they can cure him? How I wanted to put a bullet in that son of a bitch! Then why the hell didn't you? Because there's still a chance to cure him. Cure him? He just killed a man. There is no way you can cure that dog. I want you to shoot him now before he kills more blacks. So you finally joined the club. A club of horrified people who raise holy hell about that disease. That racist hate, but do absolutely nothing to stamp it out. That dog is the only weapon we have, at least to remove a part of it. I want to talk about the trainer, Keyes, because he's easily the best character in the film. His willingness to put himself in dangerous situations to do what he genuinely believes is the right thing to do makes him very likeable, and he holds on to hope that he can cure the dog even if it seems impossible. He goes through a wide range of emotions, determination, hope, fear, grief, anger, reluctance, all of which make him feel, you know, like a real human being would in that position. And uh, I don't know about you, Chief, but I tend to find that the more real a character feels in a film, the more I care and Keys is no exception. While White Dog functions slightly better as a drama than as a full-on horror film, that doesn't stop it from having some pretty horrific scenes. Like, the dog just looks plain horrifying at points. Seriously, look at this friggin' thing. Kujo's got nothing on this twisted popster. However, I think what makes the film truly frightening is how it portrays the deaths of the dog's victims. The film never portrays hate-induced death as anything other than terrifying and devastating, and each death scene in the film is shown through a very empathetic lens, and it has an immense impact on the emotional core of the plot. They're all pretty evocative scenes and push the film's message that much further. A lesser director would have filled the death scenes in this movie with a gratuitous amount of blood and gore, but thankfully this film handles the death scenes with sensitivity and care. The only gore we really see is blood on the dog's fur, and that's because Samuel Fuller understands that the deaths and the circumstances behind them are by themselves horrifying, and to show any more detail would be distasteful. I'm not saying gore can't be fun in the right context, but considering the weight of White Dog's social commentary, the way this film depicts its violence is much more favourable. Overall, White Dog is exceptional. It's a very thought-provoking, interesting, and nuanced depiction of the effects of racism. It treats its subject matter seriously, and features a fantastic character in the form of Keys. It's really great, but be warned, it may be emotionally harrowing for some. It's the afternoon in Tokyo, and a young woman is walking down the street. A serial killer has been prowling the subway, murdering young women at exactly 6pm every Monday. So instead of risking her life, she has decided to walk home instead. She makes her way past a laundrette, only to hear a mysterious clanging sound coming from within. She goes back to investigate, and sees something rolling around inside one of the washing machines. She looks a little closer and discovers that it's a severed hand. The only thing she can muster herself to do is look at the clock on the wall. In a matter of seconds, it's going to be exactly 6pm. Suddenly, she hears another sound, a sound possibly even more chilling than the hand rolling around inside the washing machine. Someone whistling. She wills herself to turn her head slightly, and comes to a horrific yet all too inevitable realization. A man is standing behind her. When this happened in our next film, Angel Dust, I knew that it was going to be something unique and special. Directed by Gakuryu Ishii, Angel Dust is the story of Setsuko Suma, a police psychologist who is investigating serial murders of young women in Tokyo. The killings happen exclusively in the subway at first, before the culprit expands his activity outwards into the city streets. Setsuko suspects that her former lover, Rei Aku, may be responsible for the crimes, 
and becomes increasingly paranoid. It's not necessarily the scariest film in this video, but it's by far the most disturbing. What makes this film stand out to me is that it is very stylized and unique from a filmmaking standpoint. There's a lot of truly great and inspired cinematography, editing, and especially sound design. It all gives the film an unusual, almost dreamlike atmosphere, which makes the whole thing feel very strange. It's not really something I can describe with words, but if you watch the film, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm clearly not the only one who feels this way. I want to talk more about the sound design because frankly, Angel Dust is some of the most interesting audio choices I have ever encountered in cinema. I have not seen another film that sounds quite like this. And it also adds to the horror because a lot of the time it catches you off guard. An example of this is how the film utilizes the killer's whistling, which reminds me a lot of Fritz Lang's M actually. There are these moments where the soundtrack is just building and building, and then suddenly this soundtrack abruptly cuts off and the killer starts whistling. <laughs> It's a chilling shock every time and it almost functions like a reverse jump scare. Also, the killer's whistling just sounds really creepy and unsettling and it just adds a layer of um dread and unease to the film. The fact that the killer operates in large crowds, save for the scene I talked about earlier, is part of what makes the film so scary for me. It feeds into your paranoia and causes you to become suspicious of just about every single citizen in view. Everyone is a suspect. It also makes the victim's fate seem inevitable, since the killer is very stealthy, there's no way for the victim to know who is and isn't out for their lives, or even if the killer is after them specifically, since there are other young women around. It's not like the killer starts running at them, making his intentions obvious. In one scene, he literally kills a lady while calmly walking past her at the same time. How are they meant to escape? The crowds also create a very claustrophobic and horrifying feeling. Imagine being surrounded by a massive group of people knowing any one of them could be after your life. The crowds also allow the killer to easily disappear back into the sea of people undetected, and I don't think I need to explain why that one's upsetting. It gets to a point where nowhere in Tokyo feels safe anymore. The main character, Setsuko, is very well written, laid, and likable. There's a lot the film does that really humanizes her, and you understand why she does what she does. The way she gathers evidence is also really clever. The sunglasses scene has got to be one of my favorites in the whole movie. For the most part, the film gives you information when she uncovers it, making it feel like you're experiencing the film's events with her, and you feel connected to her as a result. I also love the dialogue scenes between her and Aku. It adds a lot to both of their characters and is a creative way of showing us how they think. だったらこの写真の意味もわかるでしょ。なるほど。強い孤立感に加えて異常識格と犯行地でのイニシャル作りが犯人を結ぶ意図というわけだ。Angel Dust is easily the most psychological film in this video, and I love how it explores themes of psychology and what is and isn't ethical. A fair amount of this movie involves themes of control, gaslighting, and the dangers of psychological manipulation, and it explores those themes through deeply unsettling lengths. There's a subplot involving this weird cult and the reverse brainwashing of some of its members performed by Aku, which raises some very compelling moral questions. While the cult is undeniably not doing anything good for anyone's mental health, the reverse brainwashing also seems to be pretty bad as well. The one time we see it is honestly one of the most upsetting scenes in the film. Aku's supposed reverse brainwashing seems quite abusive, and it is very uncomfortable to watch, even more so once you learn that, without spoiling anything, it doesn't exactly go as planned. What good is an attempt to revert an imprint of evil when all you've done is leave your own imprint of evil with disastrous effects? 
is just really disturbing and it only becomes more disturbing once it ties back into the main plot. Also, Aku appears to get a kick out of mentally toying with Setsuko. There's a scene where he uses some pretty insidious psychological methods of deception on her as a way of mocking her free will and she just completely breaks down when she realizes what's happening. And he also likes to put messed up ideas into her brain, like how he suggests that the killer's mind is materializing inside of her. One of the scariest aspects of Angel Dust is that evil lurks in almost every corner of it. Ishii's view of Tokyo is very bleak and unnerving, and even people who aren't the killer aren't really all that innocent either. One of the creepiest scenes in the whole movie involves two random guys on the subway discussing which woman they would murder if they were the killer. Now granted, these two don't do anything outright criminal or evil, but if you ask me, they're still pretty weird and creepy for having this conversation in the first place, and I can't help but feel a suppressed side of them is crawling its way into the light. Considering the plot of Angel Dust, and the fact that the Tokyo subway siren attack happened just one year after the film's release, I can't help but feel its depiction of Tokyo is darkly prophetic in some way. Some have complained that the ending is confusing, and for a first time watch, it is, mostly because the film is kind of vague about a few things. However, after re-watching the film, I came to understand why certain scenes were there and what their significance was, and everything clicked and made a lot more sense for me. If I'm being honest, it was kind of like watching it for the first time again. Also, the film includes all these little details which might not be immediately apparent until a second watch. So if the ending leaves you a little confused, don't be afraid to rewatch the film because it rewards rewatches big time. Overall, Angel Dust just gets it, man. It might not necessarily frighten you from moment to moment, but it does quietly crawl its way underneath your skin in a way that will deeply disturb you throughout and will last with you for long after the credits roll. It's the kind of film that becomes more and more unsettling the more you think about it. It knows how to build a creepy atmosphere and an engaging mystery. It features a likable main character, truly twisted concepts, and brilliant, unique filmmaking. And once it plants itself into your mind, it'll only continue to grow from there. It's, in my opinion, the best film in this entire video, and an absolute masterpiece of psychological horror. So yeah, uh, check it out! <laughs> I'm not going to sugarcoat anything here. Retribution is easily the scariest film in this video. I'm not kidding, there are scenes in this thing that chill me to the bone just thinking about them. Directed by the wonderful and amazing Kyoshi Kurosawa, no relation to Akira Kurosawa, who is mostly known for other great horror movies, such as Cure and Pulse, Retribution is the story of Detective Yoshioka. Yoshioka is investigating a series of murders, believing a possible serial killer is on a rampage. Mysteriously, all the evidence he collects points to him as the primary suspect, and as he tries to prove his innocence, he is haunted by visions of a ghostly woman dressed in red who claims he murdered her, and the more he uncovers, the more his psyche is scarred. Retribution is a wonderful combination of Kyoshi Kurosawa's more popular films. You get the character study and police procedural stuff from Kyo, and the weird creepy ghost shit from Pulse. Much like Pulse, the film uses the uncanny valley to delightful effect. The ghost has the appearance of a human woman, yet moves in a very strange and unnatural way, and she also doesn't blink, creating a very strange and frankly terrifying antagonist from appearance and movement alone. And I must emphasize that the way she moves is truly unsettling. The way she just creeps forward and just slides across the ground is really freaky. She feels almost alien, like a horrendous otherworldly force invading our world. But I think an important question to ask here is what makes her truly threatening beyond unnatural movement? What pushes her from scary to terrifying? As part of an interview with Reverse Shot, Kyoshi Kurosawa was asked why J-horror was so successful in America and if there was anything J-horror films offered that American horror films didn't. In response, he discussed the difference between the characterization of ghosts in Japanese culture and Western culture, stating that Western ghosts make grand and terrifying entrances, while Japanese ghosts are just there a haunting other presence. He brings up Japanese ghost movies from the 50s and 60s, stating that in those movies the ghosts just show up in the corner of a room to tell you how vengeful they are, 
but never acting on it, continuing to just be a presence. He goes on to say that this kind of horror is far more terrifying to him, because in western horror movies when a ghost attacks you, you can fight back, and you're fighting for the idea that you can beat the evil and just go back to your happy life. When the ghost is just another presence, you're forced to find a way to coexist with it. I love that quote from him at the end there. I find the idea that one just has to live with this thing much more terrifying. We have no chances of running away or fighting it. You're stuck with it forever. And that brings us back to Retribution. The ghost doesn't attack our main character. She doesn't threaten his life. The worst she ever really does is just back him into a corner. She's just... there. Sitting in a corner telling Detective Yoshioka how vengeful she feels. The ghost carries with her a deeply arresting presence that is chilling to the core. There are also these long, lingering shots of her that feel like she's staring into your soul. I was genuinely terrified when she first showed up. Every time she showed up on screen, I felt as though the Hereditary soundtrack should have started playing or something. <laughs> like, I, I laugh about it now, but I was so scared watching this movie. It also must be said that Koji Yakusho, the guy who plays the detective, is acting his heart out in the scene with a ghost. He seems so genuinely frightened and confused, which adds a lot to what these scenes are going for. It's a genuinely fantastic performance. The fact that he is so terrified adds a lot of urgency and terror to the film. His movements become a lot more frantic, and he's like panting and sweating, and his eyes are wide with terror and swelling with tears and shit. He looks like he's having like an actual panic attack or something. Like, what were you doing to this man on set, Yoshi? I want to talk more about Koji Akasho's performance, because while I talked about how great he is at being scared, he's brilliant in other departments as well. Throughout the film, Detective Yoshioka's mask of stoicism slowly slips from his face. Koji does a great job at betraying the detective's desperation to prove his innocence and how it becomes harder to control himself. He looks so greasy, sweaty, and exhausted the whole movie. I love it. But Koji also does an amazing job at showing an emotionally vulnerable side to the detective in the scenes with his wife. The more he loses his mind, the more he relies on her for emotional support and comfort and in a way, he begins to use her like his own personal psychiatrist. He just can't seem to cope without her. The facial expressions Koji Yakusho pulls off are unreal. The man is an absolute talent, and even though I've only ever seen him in Kyoshi Kurosawa films, I consider him one of my favorite Japanese actors. Something important to note about Retribution is that it's pretty depressing looking. It isn't particularly colorful at all. Its main color palette consists of gray, white, black, brown, beige, and tan yellow. Even the water looks sad. It actually works really well for what the film is going for because, scary as it is, it is equally a tale of sadness and sorrow. The color palette does a fantastic job of matching the film's tone. It's a bleak story and the visuals match that. I also want to add that color-wise, the ghost's dress is the most vibrant thing in the whole movie, which adds to the feeling that she's an otherworldly force that doesn't belong. The film also contains a couple plot twists towards the end, one of which was really effective and changed the way I viewed Detective Yoshioka. The ending as a whole is just really scary and the final shot which I won't spoil is extremely chilling. Overall, Retribution is fantastic. It features a phenomenal performance from Koji Akusho, a truly frightening antagonist, bone-chilling visuals, and it is otherwise boosted to greatness thanks to Kiyoshi Kurosawa's signature style of horror filmmaking. It's a truly terrifying film that not nearly enough people have seen. Please watch this one in any way you can. It deserves to stand side by side with Cure and Pulse as one of Kiyoshi Kurosawa's J-horror classics. は Last but not least, I present to you Alone, which is an absolutely thrilling tale of survival. Directed by John Hyams, the film's story concerns a woman named Jessica Swanson, a widowed traveler. During her journey, she is followed by a very creepy guy who turns out to be a serial killer. Eventually, he is successful in kidnapping her, but she manages to escape into the woods. As he pursues her, she is forced to fight for her life against both him and the wilderness. Now, admittedly, I'm kind of cheating with this one, because it isn't really obscure, 
at least not in comparison to some of the other films in this video. It was on Netflix for a while and DVDs of it aren't all that hard to find. I could literally go down to my local JB right now and pick up a copy. However, with box office earnings like this, you're gonna tell me this movie ain't underrated? Anyways, Alone is a very simple movie, but that's what makes it work. It plays on two very primal fears, being stalked and being chased. It's a film that places its protagonist in a situation in which he is hunted down as though she is prey to a ferocious predator. And watching her navigate through these woods trying to survive through this awful situation is frankly riveting. The villain is pretty much always on her tail, which creates a great sense of sustained threat. The film never really presses on the brakes or slows down at all. Something tense is almost always happening. It's an utterly relentless watch. The film uses the wilderness as a setting really well, and it actually feels like the script was written with this setting in mind, rather than just, oh shit, we don't have any money, let's just film in the woods. I really like how it acts as both an advantage and a disadvantage to Jessica. She's able to use the river to escape in one scene, and hide in bodies of water, and pick up a branch, and use it as a weapon and as a walking stick. But she's also barefoot, so walking on stuff is kind of a problem, like when she steps on a stick and it goes through her foot. Nolly! And there aren't many places for her to hide, which means she has to be extremely stealthy. I also find the fact that Jessica is wearing a purple hoodie to be part of the tension. I know that sounds weird, but just let me explain. I know it's fairly common for characters in movies and TV shows and video games and whatnot to wear colors like red, white, blue, or purple while exploring the woods because it contrasts with their surroundings and makes it easier for the viewer to see them, and alone is no different. However, think about it like this. If it's easy for us to see Jessica amongst the wilderness, then it's also easy for the killer to see Jessica amongst the wilderness. There's a twist relating to the villain which fundamentally doesn't add a whole lot to the story, but it does add to the creepiness of his character and, without spoiling anything, shows that just about anyone could be psychos hiding underneath a veneer of caring and normality. I think Alone is really heightened by really solid cinematography and, above all else, great, great performances from the two leads. Jules Wilcox, in particular, really sells her character and her emotions. I honestly believe she deserves more work. Her eyes by themselves say so much, and it's also notable that, unlike a lot of other protagonists in a horror thriller like this, Jessica actually makes intelligent decisions, making her rather likable. Mark Menchaka, I hope that's how you pronounce that, also sells his character very well. He has a genuinely creepy and aggressive demeanor to him, his scenes are genuinely scary and off-putting. He's like a ticking time bomb ready to explode at any moment, and at a few points throughout the film, he does. Even the performances from minor characters, such as Robert, are really great and truly elevate this film. Seeing how genuinely scared he looks adds a lot more tension to the scene he's in than it already has. Overall, Alone is a great little horror thriller. It's really well made and really well acted, and it uses its limitations and its simplistic plot to its advantage to create a tense, engaging, and brisk thrill. Ride. It may not be as thought-provoking as some of the other films in this video, but if you're looking for a simple, fun, and intense horror film that's competently put together and easy to enjoy, then Alone is certainly a good option. I know you're close. I know I hit you. I'd give you about two hours before you bleed to death. Soon the cramps will set in. Spreading through your body. And then the rot will start. Well, those were my obscure and underrated horror recommendations that I think you should watch this Halloween. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe if you haven't already. I also have a letterbox link in the description for that. I strongly urge you to watch these movies. They're really great. Don't forget to have yourself a happy Halloween. And yeah, I think they'll do it. I hope to see you next time, everybody. Bye.